me now. Good to see everybody this evening. Good to see Kim from Prattville. Uh, good to see Kenna out June. And uh, glad, glad that we're here this evening. I uh, got several on our sick list. Um, of course, Audrey Pede, Arnold Mungie, Arnold's here. Bonnie Wright, Sue Wheeler, Nancy Marshall, Bonnie Marshall and Underwood, Jerry Della Hill, Lucille Watkins, Connie Stacy, uh, Marilyn Galloway, Kenneth Rourke, Kenneth here, um, May Smith, Geraldine Yeager, Travis Dean. Travis is here. He said it'd be all right if uh, the uh, physical therapist would leave him alone. So. Uh, Anyway, Tommy Warner, Amanda Bolton, Colleen Corrado, Candy Campbell, Maria Martin, Ramona Slocum, Donnie Turner. Any news on Donnie? Any news on Donnie Turner? Elaine, any news on Donnie Turner? Okay. Okay. I just, I didn't know if there's anything changed. Uh, Juanita Chanel, Juanita Griffin, Danny Mills, Nate Kidwood. How's Nate doing? Is he on medicine? No? Okay. Well, good. Maybe you won't. Um, Day, uh, Sylvia Day, David Shirley, Tina Carroll, uh, Lila Ellis, Edison, uh, Steve Slocum, Rhonda Burtnett. She is recovering from back surgery in UAB and... Uh, Bob is, uh, the, the issues that she's having is digestive issues. Uh, and I think that's from the surgeries, um, surgery. Uh, but anyway, she is on a diet that will uh, uh, be easy to process. And uh, of course she's, you know, she's dealing with pain and of course pain medicine and then of course uh, digestive issues and so uh, anyway, so keep them in your prayers. I don't know. Uh, they haven't. Uh, Bob said that they were talking about sending her home, but they didn't have not set a time or a day. So uh, keep um, Rhonda in your prayers. Also, Amanda Underwood, and I guess y'all got the text where she is not going to have radiation or chemo. So that's really good news. Um, also, uh, Vicki Wyatt, she's recovering from surgery, shoulder surgery. Uh, Janice Potter, you, she is home, and she is also recovering from shoulder surgery. And then Vivian Clifton, uh, we've had this on Facebook. This is Deanna Wilson's mother. She moved down about two years ago, and I think they came once or twice, and then COVID hit. Uh, but Vivian is in Fairhope. Uh, she has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, they, uh, she's not able to, to get out of bed, so uh, I don't know. I haven't talked to Deanna or uh, found out what the doctors have said, So, uh, but keep her in your prayers. Uh, she, Vivian moved from... Birmingham, and I forgot what congregation she attended up there. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, Deanna, uh, she was working at Wolf Bay Lodge, and uh, of course she she quit so that she could take care of her mother. So, but just keep uh, Vivian uh, in your prayers. Um, 
And then I forgot to put DMAR on here. I knew I did that just as soon as I hit punch the button to start printing the bulletins, I realized I left DMAR off. But he had his surgery this week too, his second one. Okay, so keep, keep DMAR in your prayers. Uh, back surgery is no picnic. Um, and also, I may have told you all this, but Nellie Tucker has moved to Tuscaloosa. She is in a, an assisted living home there. And then Amy, y'all remember Amy? She is in Eagle Wings, which is a home for special needs adult children or adults. Uh, and I'm not sure, I think Amy has probably some type of autism, but uh, she, is, she is there at that home. So uh, anyway, uh, keep, uh, keep them in your prayers also. Is there anybody that we need to, to add to our list or take off of our list or whatever? Take Lila off, okay. I can find her. I can't see the trees for the forest. Three point seven pounds. Okay. Um, all right. We'll get. We'll take Lila off. Anybody else? Take Kenneth off. All right. We're gonna X you out, Kenneth. <laughs> Who else? Okay. Marty Petty John, and she lives where? Shawnee, Oklahoma. Travis, you want us to leave you on or take you off? Okay. You were saying something about needed pain pills. I couldn't tell if it was Elizabeth that needed the pain pills or you're the one that needed the pain pills. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So nobody to say anything. All right. So, uh, all right. We, uh, we're glad that, you know, we can take everybody off that wants to go off because uh, pretty, uh, can get pretty intense at times. Anybody else? All right, well, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the many blessings of this day as we approach thy throne of grace and mercy. We ask thy blessings upon those that we have mentioned on our list, and we pray, Father, for their ease of pain and for their health. We ask thee to watch over them and bless them. Father, we uh, ask thee to bless the church here at Foley and each and every member, and of course, Father, as the we continue the work. We pray that we will ever stand upon thy truth. Father, we ask thee to bless us in our Bible study this hour and forgive us of any sins that may stand between us and thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm not sure exactly where we left off because I kind of rambled around last week talking about the the, how that the 17 nations of people or 15 nations of people ended up in Jerusalem and in uh, the process, of course, the Bible is very clear uh, about them being in the captivity. And then when they uh, were talking about the Hebrew people, they're known as Jews. And they got their name Jews from the fact that uh, they, were, they were captives from Judea. And so the... Um, Persians uh, kind of shortened that, call, started calling them Jews, and it was a nickname that really stuck. And so the Jews, as they left Persian captivity, Nebuchadnezzar captured them. They stayed in Babylonian captivity. Persians came in, took over Babylon. Persians says, go home. We don't want to feed you. We'll send an army escort for you to go back home. We'll build your temples. We'll build your houses. Uh, you, pay, you pay taxes to us, 
And of course, that's how that happened. And then that happened as long as, um, as the Persian Empire stood. And then, of course, Alexander the Great comes along and he takes over the Persian Empire and uh, it's a whole new ball game from them. And when, that, when, when uh, Alexander the Great dies, the kingdom that he had conquered were, was divided into four kingdoms. Uh, you got the Ptolemies, you got the Seleucids, uh, there's two other uh, the groups. The Seleucids were the ones that were in Jerusalem and in Judea. Ptolemies were, I think, were the ones that Macedonia. Uh, the Ptolemies were the ones, I believe, were down in, uh, in Egypt. But regardless of that, it was divided into four, four kingdoms. Alexander the Great's uh, uh, kingdom was divided into four parts when he died. And he died at the age of 33, and he died one night uh, of his own drunken vomit because nobody would follow him to the east. They were tired, ready to go home. And so uh, he got drunk one night and drowned in his own vomit uh, at the age of 33 years old. But his kingdom was divided up in four parts. You had Antiochus Epiphanes coming into Jerusalem and in the Feast of Purim, as the Jews have it now, is where the, they, uh, Antiochus tried to, uh, tried to destroy Jerusalem, and he couldn't because of the Maccabees. And uh, Antiochus uh, killed a pig and took the guts and slung it all over the temple, inside the temple. And so... The Jews were under pressure. But anyway, that's where the Feast of Lights come from, from the Jewish side. Through that, through that Macedonian, or through that history of the Maccabees. Uh, and it's very interesting. It's, uh, and, and the books that you have, the intertestament books that you have in some of your Bibles, remember they are not inspired books. They're not inspired. But the Maccabees... Uh, or, or is history. Now you have to remember it's, it's kind of slanted towards the Jews, but it's still history. And, and we get a lot of insight in that 400 period from, from Malachi until Jesus comes into the world. That 400 period of 400 years, God did not speak. Uh, but but the historians wrote these things down and gives us somewhat an idea. And, and of course, there's a lot of, a lot of tests to prove a book is inspired. And the Maccabees, it was four books and, and condensed to two. Uh, and you have Baal and the Dragon, which was similar to Daniel in, in Babylon. And then you got the book of Susanna, and then you got the book of Tobias. Uh, those books are what they call pseudopigrapha, which means false writing. And so uh, a lot of the books like Tobias and S S the book of Susanna and the book of uh, uh, Baal and the Dragon uh, are, are books that men tried to work into our Bible, but Greek scholars historians as after they examined it it did not uh, meet the test of an inspired book uh, first of all you got grammar um, then you have uh, you know the correct use of grammar then you've got geography uh, the the way the terrain goes and then another one which is very important is prophecy and of course, those books do not have prophecy in them. And they don't have prophecy in them because they're not inspired. And so, anyway, and there are other, there are other tests that they use to, to make sure that a book belongs in the English Bible or the Bible that we have. All right. So, you know, I said all of that because of this, that all of those things you played into the fact in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is called the hub of the Bible. 
Because everything centers around Acts 2. Everything. Everything in the Bible centers around Acts 2. From the book of Genesis to Malachi, it centers here. And then, of course, when you, uh, of course, you've got also, you got the Gospels. Uh, this is before Jesus, uh, or this is up until the time Jesus ascends. Then, of course, Acts uh, you got Acts 1 over here. But anyway, all the other books center here from here to Revelation. So the, the point that I'm making is that even though history, we don't have the entire inspired history of that 400 years, it all still plays to the point of Acts 2. For what reason? The church is coming into existence. You know, the destruction of Jerusalem back during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, it was destroyed in 589 or 587 B.C. And so you got 587 years for, for Jerusalem to be back up and running and doing business and the temple be rebuilt and, and worship back in there before the Messiah can come into the world. So it's pretty, it's very interesting. And, and you know, when you get into um, Nehemiah, when he comes to rebuild the walls, you know, it's now it's down to 444 years. So Nehemiah has the walls rebuilt, and of course Ezra has the temple rebuilt. Uh, Zerubbabel is the governor of the land. The, the temple is now called Zerubbabel's temple. It's not Solomon's temple anymore. And then when you get into the Maccabean period and into about 100 years before Christ comes into the world, Herod's come in and they begin to restore the temple, restore what, what Antiochus Epiphanes has done and to continue to build. And so from the time of about 90 B.C., 90 years before Christ, uh, up until... Uh, from 90 B.C. until 70 A.D., the Herod's temple was continually being built. It was continually being worked on. Uh, they continued to put outer courts. So the, the real temple, you know, was uh, a, the most holy place it comprised of that, and then, of course, the holy place, uh, which was the, um, the candlestick, table of showbread, the altar of incense. And here was supposed to be the Ark of the Covenant. But the Ark of the Covenant was not there. It was, wasn't there in the days of Jesus. It wasn't there in the days of Zerubbabel, it was, which was... Uh, 400 B.C. Or, or, yeah, about 400 B.C. It wasn't there. So what happened to it? Probably Nebuchadnezzar got it and melted it down, probably. Now, I know if y'all watched, what's that uh, Harrison Ford movie? Uh, they, they find it. They're not going to find the Ark of the Covenant. You're not going to find it. It was, Nebuchadnezzar got a hold of it. And that leads to another point. So what happened to Uzzah when he touched the ark? All right, so why, why, why when the ark was taken by Nebuchadnezzar, why don't we have a record of any of them dying? I think it is explained in the book of Ezekiel. When you open up the book of Ezekiel and you see the wheels and the fires and all this, and you see that, that storm leaving Jerusalem and heading up, it's, it's symbolic of the fact that the presence of God has now left Jerusalem. It has left the temple. And the things that were holy, the worship, they had literally destroyed the worship there. And, and so God says, I'm leaving, so to, so to speak, and so Nebuchadnezzar comes in and just destroys Jerusalem. Uh, and and probably, so it was probably melted down. You wouldn't never find the Ark of the Covenant. Now, back in 80, 1989, uh, 
A guy said that he wrote a paper that says when Jesus died on the, uh, on the cross and the Roman soldier pierced his side and there was a great earthquake, the blood of Jesus dripped down through a crack in the earth and the Ark of the Covenant was right there and the blood fell on the Ark of the Covenant. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, they have never found the Ark of the Covenant. They said it was a secret room down here. Well, if that be the case, then why haven't they found it? Because when you, uh, when you go to Norman Gleck back in the 1930s, I mean, he dug up Jerusalem. He dug the whole place up. And he was uncovering various things and never did find the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, if you've got a... Um, Thompson Chain Reference Bible. In the back of that, you've got, an, you've, got a, you've got a section of archaeology by J.A. Thompson. And uh, if you want to buy that book, you can buy that by itself. Uh, it is it's called J.A. Thompson's Archaeology or something of the Bible. Uh, and I guess it's still in print. And it's very reliable. His work was very reliable. Uh, along with Norman, uh, I want to call it Gleck. Uh, Israel can tell me when we get back. Uh, but anyway, there are, there are just piles of books of archaeology on the, of the Bible and during biblical times, during modern period, that they have dug up all of Jerusalem and went into these rooms and they have never found the Ark of the Covenant. And you never will. I can guarantee you that. Uh, it, if you had, they would have already found it. So I said all of that because of the providence of God, because of how things work, because everything centers around Acts chapter 2. And then, of course, there's Peter's sermon. And who is the center of Peter's sermon? That's an easy question. Jesus Christ. He is the center of that sermon. He is the message of that sermon. And what Peter says is that all of the things that God had done through, through time is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And, of course, uh, it comes to the point uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, where they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, You have crucified and killed the very Son of God. And Peter has already proven that, proven that with David. And so uh, he tells them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the point is that here, everything here points to, but, and so now you've got uh, the, the Gospels and the Acts, and, and of course Acts is the only history book that relates to the first 30 years of the church. Uh, if you want to know what happened in the first 30 years of the church, the only place you're going to find it is in the book of Acts. That's the only place. And then, of course, um, you have other books. You have Paul's writings. You have Peter's writings. You've got the general epistles, which is Peter and John and Jude. And you've got Paul's writings from Romans all the way through Hebrews. Uh, so, anyway... And they all point to Acts 2. They all point to Jesus Christ as, uh, as the Messiah. All right? Is there anything that we want to talk about in Acts chapter 2? In verse number 40 of Acts 2, it says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Now, why was, why was he talking about them being a perverse generation? Because during the time of Nebuchadnezzar was human sacrifice going on. And the worshiping of, of these idols, you had the worship of Moloch and of Chemosh, which were the gods, the fire gods of the Moabites and the Amorites. You had, you had the worship of the golden calf, not so much during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, but you had, had it during the time of, of when the children of Israel come out of Egypt and when during the period of the judges and all this. Uh, but he calls this, this generation 
a perverse generation. So why would that be? Why would they be a perverse generation? And it, it comes to this. When God took them into captivity, he says, I will break you of your idolatry. So they did. He did. They, they quit serving idols. They quit human sacrifice. Uh, they began to serve God. But the problem was they turned inward. Instead of outward, they turned inward. And from, from the fact of that 400 uh, years, you had the Pharisees. You had the Sadducees. Uh, you had the Herodians, which uh, uh, popped up around 100 years uh, um, from Christ. You had the Zealots, which was zealous. Uh, you, they were zealous for Israel. Uh, they were a military group. This was religious. This was religious. This was political. This was political. Then you had the Essenes. Uh, and Essenes were the ones who lived in the wilderness. And they were somewhat of a religious group, but they would, they would, they, what they said was the flesh is evil, and so they would punish the flesh, and that way they would live in caves. Uh, they would not, they would wear uh, clothing like John the baptizer. Uh, they would eat honey and locusts and, and things of that. And they believed the flesh being evil, so if you, if you comforted the flesh, then, then you were turning evil, that you were sinning. Yeah, well, it, it grew out of that, but yeah, they, there was a group called the Pillar Monks, and the Pillar Monks would go to these ruins, these cities, and they would look at these giant columns that were standing there and they would climb those and build a platform and they would, they would sit on top of these things uh, and to ex be exposed from the weather because they felt like the flesh was evil and they had to punish the flesh and all this kind of stuff. Now, if you read a lot of scholars, and I say scholars, they will tell you that John the Baptist was an Essene. I don't think he was. I know he lived out in the wilderness like, um, like Elijah, but he was not, he didn't believe the flesh was evil and he wasn't trying to punish himself. He just lived like Elijah and when he did, the multitudes of people came to it. So... If you read something that says that John the Baptist was an Essene, don't believe it because I don't think it's true. But uh, the point is that all of these groups really grew out of that 400-year period between Malachi and Matthew. And then, of course, I said it turned inward. These became very self-righteous. These controlled the temple, and they were very wealthy. And, of course, uh, they, they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. These were political in the fact that they were loyal to Herod. Now, Herod was not a Jew. He was an Igemean, and he was not a Jew. And so they were loyal to him. Then, of course, there was those zealots which were loyal to, to Israel or to the Hebrew people or to the Jews. And they were, they were constantly... Uh, starting uh, picking fights. And uh, that was one of the reasons why Jerusalem was destroyed. I say one reason, one out of many reasons. The Zealots kept this instigation uh, going on and trying to, to cause problems and riots. But I said all of that because everything there leads to Acts 2. And they had turned turned inward. They had turned into self-righteousness. And we've been doing a lot of study in the book of Luke, and we know the character of the Pharisees. You know, they, they did not like the tax collectors, and they did not like sinners, and they did not believe that they could be saved. It was the Pharisees. The Pharisees would not shake hands with you because you may have touched a dead body. Uh, they would not eat with you unless you were a Pharisee. And the Pharisees, of course, 
added somewhere around, I want to say 600 laws to the law of Moses. And I to, I've told you some, uh, they were not to work on the Sabbath day. So if you went to a well and let a bucket down by a rope at the well and tr to draw water, that was work. But if you took your belt off, and you tied it around the rope, and then you tied it around the bucket, and you let it down, that was not work. Then, of course, there was the eighth, the Sabbath day's journey, which was about seven-eighths of a mile. And that was established during the time of the, the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness. And that was a time to where people would on the Sabbath day, leave their tent and come to the, uh, the tabernacle on the Sabbath day. And that's where they would offer sacrifice. That's where the priest would pray. They would read from the law. They would do all of these things. And, of course, they could only go seven-eighths of a mile. But here's the problem. Sadducee, uh, the Pharisees wanted to go from Jerusalem to Galilee, and it was 60 miles. And so they wanted to travel on the Sabbath day. First of all, they would not go through Samaria. They'd go around. But what they would do is go and travel seven-eighths of a mile, sit down, pull out a sandwich, take a bite out of it, because where you eat is where your home is, so you can get up and go another seven-eighths of a mile. And you could do that on the Sabbath day. You see, that's what the Pharisees had done to the law of Moses. That's what they had done to it. So when, when Peter says that you have uh, saved yourself from this perverse generation, the corruption of the people had turned inward, and they were, they were deceitful, they were liars, they had, they had distorted the law of Moses. Uh, this, this actually grew, grew out of a time of Nehemiah, because when Nehemiah goes down to Jerusalem, and the people that are in the land, the Jews, have married Gentiles. And there was these Samaritans. And they could not speak Hebrew. They could not read the law. Nehemiah says, separate yourselves from this people. And that's the, that's the word, Pharisee. It means to be separate. So it actually grew. And, and, and that was about 444 B.C., so th that's where they started growing out of. And, of course, Paul was a Pharisee uh, before he obeyed the gospel of Christ. And, of course, they had turned against, um, uh, of course, they crucified Christ. And then in verse 41 of Acts 2, it says, And then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and, about, and that day about 3,000 were added to them. So you had 3,000 people obey the gospel on the day of Pentecost. How many were there? Don't really know. Uh, some say a million, but that'd be a lot in Jerusalem, a lot of people. Uh, and I don't know what conservative scholars say, but even if it was 100,000, you know, three out of 100,000, uh, what is that? 3% or is it less than that? Three-tenths of a percent. So that's not many people, but that's enough for the church or, or that would hear the gospel and obey it. But then when you get into Acts 3 and 4, now you've got, you got 5,000. And then when you get on to chapter 5, now you have the multitude. So it's growing. And, and here's the thing. When we were in Guyana, South America, we went into a village uh, called Morakabai, went into that village, and we uh, held a campaign. About 50 or 60 people obeyed the gospel. Uh, so we, the church was established, and the next year we go back. And, of course, Jerry Davidson wanted to go back to Maracaibo again. And I said, well, you know, we've already been there. Let's go to a new village. And he said, no, we need to go there. So we did, and again, when we preached the gospel, guess what? We had another 50 or 60 people obey. So we kept going back, and people kept obeying the gospel. And, and the point is that in Barakaba, back in the year 2005, there were 250 members of the church there in Barakaba, in that Indian village. 
And, uh, and that was just part of the work that was doing in all of these, these villages uh, because when they heard the gospel, they believed it and they obeyed it. All right, and I, know, uh, I don't remember why I said all that, but here's, here's, here's the thing. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, what is this breaking of bread? Lord's Supper. It's often used as the Lord's Supper. Uh, and there's several uh, passages and, of course, prayers and fellowship. And then great fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So when the apostles preached the gospel, they proved their message, that they, their message came from God through miracles. And, of course, you, you also have to remember this. From this 400-year period, God did not speak from Malachi to Matthew. Uh, I say Matthew from the time Jesus came into the world. This 400 years, God did not speak. There were no miracles done in that 400-year period. There was a dead silence from heaven, a dead silence. And so you had prophets such as Elijah who did seven miracles. We can count seven miracles that he did. Elisha asked for a double portion. So how many miracles did he do? Fourteen. You can go back and count all the miracles he did, and there were 14 miracles. You had other prophets that did, did miracles, but they were nowhere near what Jesus did when he came into the earth. Now, when John the Baptist come, John is the first prophet after this 400-year period, and John is preaching. But John never wrote a book, and he never performed a miracle. Never did. He never did prove his message came from God. But I'm telling you what, but he preached hellfire and brimstone to those Pharisees and Sadducees when they came out. So here is his John who preaching the word of God, and yet here's Jesus when he comes into the world. What does he do? John, John preaches the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Roman soldier says, well, what will we do? He says, you repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Roman soldiers were baptized under John. But when Jesus came, he preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But he also healed the blind man. And he would cast out the demons. And he would heal the sick. And he would cause the lame to walk. He raised the dead. And, and when you look at the end of Matthew 4 and Luke 4, his, fr f uh, his fame spread out not only through the land of Israel, but al also into Syria and into Phoenicia and down into Egypt and down into these other places. The fame of Jesus went everywhere. That's right. And then Jesus did the opposite. He went to yeah, exactly right. You know, John, you have, here's the Jordan Valley right here. And you've got Jerusalem right here. You've got Jericho right here. John preached somewhere in here in the wilderness of Judea at the Jordan River. There were, where he preached, the Bible says he baptized and there was much water. So he preached probably just north of Jericho. That seems to be the place. Because the Jordan River is not a wide river and it's not a deep river. It's a muddy river. So you have to leave an elevation of about 3,000 feet from Galilee down to 900 feet below sea level at, at, at the Dead Sea right here. So over a period of 60 miles from 3,000 to 900 feet below, that's almost 4,000 feet drop that the Jordan River has to travel from Galilee down to here, which means that
that the Jordan River has to do this. If it doesn't, you're just going to wash the whole thing out. All right, so now you got the Jordan River here. So there were pockets of water that were deep enough to baptize people. So when Naaman came and asked Elisha what to do, Elisha says, go dip seven times in the Jordan River. What did he say? That's a nasty river. Let me go up to the rivers of Assyria where they're clean. This is, this is a, a very shallow river. And it's, it's, it winds, it has to wind through the Jordan Valley because of the elevation, the drop of the elevation. So there's only pockets of water where, that are deep enough to baptize. And as Brother Sewell said, when John baptized, he, he preached right here. He didn't go up here. He preached right here. And they came to him. And he baptized right there. But when Jesus came, he started in Nazareth. And he went into Capernaum and then, uh, what's the other city of, uh, uh, Bethsaida, is it Bethsaida, is that it? And then, of course, in Jerusalem down here, he went through Samaria, but he'd go over here to Phoenicia, and he'd go over here to Syria. And when he went there, guess what? They had already heard about Jesus because of the healing. The Syro-Phoenician woman which was about 140 miles from the Sea, sea of Galilee towards this, this way, she knew who Jesus was. Jesus went into that region to get away from people, and when he went up there, she recognized him. Yes, exactly right. Fed him on two occasions. Right around the Sea, right around the sea of Galilee, you've got an elevation uh, where the mountains are high and they come down and, and it's easy uh, where Jesus could preach, but, but also this is where the people could spread out and he fed 5,000 on one occasion and 3,000 on another. Was it three or 4,000? But anyway, Jesus fed them with just a handful of, uh, of food. You know, you go down to Captain D's and get two little fish and five loaves of bread, that doesn't even make a meal for me now. I can tell you that right now. But it was enough to where they take up 12 baskets of food, 12 crumbs, uh, 12 baskets of crumbs. Now, so why, does it, why was the significance of 12 baskets of crumbs? Well, that's right. Each one of the disciples picked up that much was left over. But also in the crumbs, the Jewish superstition was that demons lived in the crumbs of the bread. Now that was superstition, but that's, but Matthew makes a point uh, to say that, either Matthew or John makes a point to bring that out. So Jesus, when he, when he preached, his fame was known all over. And they came to him, and he'd go to Galilee, and they would they would almost overtake him and he'd have to get the boat to preach uh, out on the boat to, while the people were on the land and then they'd go to the other side and so they'd just run around on the other side to follow him. So anyway, it's, it is so profound of, of what took place when Jesus came into the world because everything was working, working to that point Everything. Brother Israel has been talking about providence in our class in the book of Philemon. I tell you what, I, you, it, it is fascinating of the providence of God and how things came together and how the church came about. Uh, so anyway, so they, uh, they uh, of course it says fear came upon every church and now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone has need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. So where did they go to meet? You remember you had the temple, and we talked about the most holy place, holy place. But also around the temple were rooms being built, courtyards being built, 
And you had a courtyard for the Gentiles. You had a courtyard for the women. You had a courtyard for different things. And they would just go there, and that's where they would meet. Uh, these people were out-of-towners. A lot of them were, and they stayed in Jerusalem. All right, so uh, anyway, we'll start with chapter 3 uh, next week. we still got one week before singing. Is that right? All right, so today is the 20th. That means the 27th, right? 427. Well, it's certainly as good to see everybody out this evening for our Bible class, midweek Bible class. We have 51, and it's certainly good to see everyone. Good to see everybody uh, tonight. Our song of invitation will be number 124. 124, we'll sing the first and the last verses uh, in just a few moments. We've been studying in the book of Acts, and I probably should have let Brother Lester teach his class because they, they do such a great job with it. We are... Uh, uh, videoing his class, but also uh, uh, that now you can get two perspectives on that. And certainly it is uh, a book that is just packed with all kinds of great uh, lessons for us and certainly great truths. But one of the things that uh, we notice in, in this, in the book of Acts, is the preaching of the gospel. And the fact is, as we talked about, the providence of God and how through time, through history, and how things are lined up that when the gospel, when the Messiah comes into the world, uh, it, he is ready uh, to be that sacrifice. And of course, there was this great rejection, certainly from the Jews. And this is seen in Acts chapter 2, where Peter and John are at the gate. They are at the temple. There is a man who is lame. And it's very interesting because Luke says that he was lame from his mother's, uh, from his birth. And the fact is that they carried him and they laid him at the gate. And so uh, Luke makes the point that this man could not even walk. When the man asked for alms, Peter says, gold and silver have I none, but what I do have I'll give you. And Peter takes this opportunity uh, to, to preach a lesson to those individuals around that were at the temple. And he says this in verse 13, that the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. And we, we know the story, that when Jesus was on trial with Pilate, Pilate didn't find anything fault with him, but it was the people, it was those Jews who kept saying, crucify him and release unto us Barabbas. Set Barabbas, a murderer, let him loose. But what Peter makes a very interesting statement where he says that he glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered up. Well, there were several occasions in whom Jesus, Jesus was glorified before the Father. At his baptism in Matthew chapter 4, and also recorded in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus uh, was baptized of John, uh, the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The voice from heaven identifying that Jesus was his Son, the Son of God. And then at the Mount of Transfiguration, in the middle of the night, on the top of a high mountain, and the witnesses of Peter and James and John where Peter was awakened by the transfiguration of Moses and Elijah and Jesus being transformed. And Luke says in this that they were heavy with sleep and that the transformation of Jesus was whiter than any fuller could do it. In other words, any person who bleached out clothes could not get the radiance of, of what Jesus and when Peter says, it is good for us to be here, let us build three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah, God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Notice this, hear him. Don't listen to Moses. Moses is dead. He's gone. The law is fixing to be done away with. 
Here's Elijah, the great prophet, the great reformer. He, he's not going to save Israel. It is, the, it is the very Son of God. And so when Peter makes this statement that he was confirmed by God in the fact that even as on the cross we can see the events taking place, as Jesus makes the statements, he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The very fact is that here Jesus died on the cross, but yet on the third day he came out of that grave, as we talked about this past Sunday. And, and, and the thing is that Paul said this in Romans 1, 4. He says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. And so we can see how great that God has, has uh, delivered Christ to die upon the cross. He was conform, confirmed. He was glorified. And now the gospel is in our hands to preach. Those people had a responsibility on the day Peter preached in the temple. We also have a responsibility to obey the gospel as it is being preached. This evening, if you're not a Christian, obey the gospel. We offer the invitation for those who, who need to respond to that gospel to be baptized, having their sins washed away. Of course, there has to be faith and there has to be repentance and that we confess uh, the name of Jesus before others and then we are baptized, which washes away our sins, Acts 22, 16. And then we become a new creature in Christ. Maybe we've done that, but you have forsaken God and turned into the world. Repent of those sins, confess your sins to God, ask the church to pray with you. If you have a need, would you come as together we stand and sing? Bring Christ your broken life, so hard by sin. worship service again. I don't think we have any new visitors, so I'll read our sick list. I have Arnold Mungi on here, but Arnold's with us tonight. Marilyn Galloway still recovering from her knee surgery. May Smith, Jerry and Della Hill, Sue Willer, Nancy Marshall, Kenneth Rort, Kenneth's with us tonight also. Vonda Marshall Underwood, Travis Dean, uh, Vicki Wyatt, Travis is here too. <laughs> Uh, Vicki Wyatt, Amanda Underwood, Janice Potter, she's recovering from so, uh, shoulder surgery. Also, uh, Rhonda Burnett in UAB in Birmingham, recovering from back surgery. Uh, I got to talk to Bob uh, Monday night. He said Rhonda came through the surgery well, but she's got so many other complications. She's having a slow recovery, and she's, she's out of ICU. She's in a room at this time, but it should be there a while yet. V Vivian uh, Clifton. Thomas Hospital, she's been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and she's not doing well. So let's remember all these in our prayers and call the ones that we can, let them know we are thinking about them. Uh, there's some free tomato plants for the Dallas Furnished out over here in the fountain room. These are a celebrity uh, brand of tomatoes, so please avail yourself of, of those. There's a youth devotional next Sunday night after the evening services. Bo Rody will be Speaking to our youth at that, Bo, Bo does a great job. There's also a sign-up sheet in the foyer to carry food to Janice and 
Dr. Potter while she's recovering from her shoulder surgery. So if you can help with that, please find the list. Birthdays this week, uh, Nick Harrison. He had a birthday yesterday, the 19th. Steve and Amanda Underwood are celebrating the anniversary tomorrow. I want to wish them a happy anniversary. And the pantry item this week is uh, canned peas and carrots. And that's all the announcements. Five hundred seventy is our closing song. We'll sing the first and last verse of this song, after which Brother O'Neill Wyatt will lead us in a word of prayer, and then we shall be dismissed. We invite those of you who would like to stand as we sing these two verses together. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with, and we thank you for the opportunity to uh, gather together tonight and study your word and spirit and truth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your only Son, Jesus, that died on the cross for the of our sins. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you continue to shower upon us each and every day and uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll uh, bless the church here in Foley and that you'll bless Brother Joel and the elders and deacons and uh, I pray that you'll bless the missionaries as they're uh, spreading the gospel uh, to other countries and Heavenly Father, I uh, pray that you'll bless all the sick that are mentioned tonight and uh, those that have undergoing surgeries and operations and pray that you'll just continue to bless bless them and and then father pray that you'll bless our country uh, pray that you'll um, bless the, the leaders our our representatives of our country and uh, those around the world and uh, pray that you'll give them the knowledge and the wisdom that they need in making their decisions and uh, pray that they'll look to you and uh, looking for guidance in those decisions. And Heavenly Father, pray for our military, that you'll keep them safe and that they'll be come home soon. And uh, Heavenly Father, we know we do stumble, we fall short of your word, and pray that you'll forgive us for our sin, so we might have a future home in heaven. And uh, pray that you'll go with us, uh, each of us tonight, and, and until we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.